We, <laughs> I wish you all a, a belated Happy New Year, hopefully a healthy one. Um, before we move on to item one, I'd like to welcome members of the public and just to remind them that this is a meeting at which the public are present, but is not a public meeting. Um, just one item of housekeeping. We're not expecting an alarm uh, this afternoon, but should you hear the alarm, please make your way uh, to the fire exits, which are over on the left hand side and behind me here. Um, and the assembly point is by the bandstand. Uh, just a reminder to members to switch off their mobile phones, turn them to silent, um, and finally to, to remember to turn on your microphones before speaking and turn them off when you've finished. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start uh, the official part of the meeting, could you please introduce themselves? Uh, hi, I'm Tamara Dale, Planning Officer in the Miners team. Matthew Paul, sir, Planning Officer in Majors. Emma Parks, the Head of Development and Building Control. I'm Sonia Sharp, Solicitor for Legal Services at Horsham. And Liz Fennick, Democratic Services Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Item one, then. Uh, do we have any apologies for absence, please? Yes, we've received apologies from Jonathan Chowan, John Milne and Jack Saheed. And Councillor Roger Noel may be late this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. So item two to prove the minutes of the last meeting, the 20th of December. I believe Councillor Croker has an amendment he would wish to put. Yes, in. thank you, Chair. Um, in the interest of clarity, on the PCS slash 31, uh, first sentence, after the words, the erection of a two-storey, can I suggest that the side extension is put in there before the comma? Hopefully it makes sense, or better sense then. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's your proposal. Have you got somebody to second that as we're changing the minutes? Thank you, Councillor Potts. So all those in favour of that amendment, or do you want me to read it again? You happy with it? Okay. Uh, all those in favour of that amendment? Thank you very much. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, other than that, what to bring? Council Platt. Sorry, Platt, yeah. Which is, yeah. Sorry, my fault. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it began with P, so I got a bit confused. Uh, do I now have to vote for minutes in complete? Or is that it? No, no. Okay, thank you. Right, item three, uh, declaration of members' interests. Are there any declarations of interest? Councillor Wright. Uh, I have two. The first applicant, uh, first one is, is that there's a member of my uh, local branch who lives close to the uh, application, um, conservative branch, but it's not a, a traditional interest. Uh, and, and the second one is, is that uh, although I don't know the applicant, um, many of uh, the farming community have, have written to me about it, but once again, not a prejudicial interest in this application. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No? Okay. Item four, uh, no announcements for me. Uh, any, anybody got any announcements? No? Okay. Item five, um, appeals. These are for noting, unless any member has any comment they wish to make on any of the appeals. Councillor Circus. I wonder whether I could ask the officers uh, a question about appeals generally. Um, we know that um, if the inspector on an appeal thinks we've behaved Councils behaved unreasonably in refusing an application, they can award costs. I just wonder how often, uh, I mean, I don't need the exact figure, I would just be interested to know how often, broadly speaking, awards of costs get made against us where it's a documents only uh, appeal as opposed to a hearing. I, I rather suspect. Uh, although I don't have the figures, and that's why I'm asking for them, um, that there are rather more cases that involve an award of costs on a, hear on a hearing, 
on an appeal that involves a hearing simply because of the expense involved. I wonder whether the officers can can give me uh, some thoughts on, on that, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Circus, I don't have any figures before me either, so I think I, I can give you a, a view, but it's no more than that because I don't, don't have anything to, to back that up. But, but I think it has to be borne in mind that in most cases, um, an applicant doesn't apply for costs. So it's it's not something that's considered on every appeal. Um, but, but I would agree with you. I think we are more likely to see a cost application for the bigger schemes, which are generally dealt with by way of a hearing or a public inquiry. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? No? Okay. In that case, we'll move on to item six. Okay, before we move to first application, which is DC 212161, could William Bedford please go up to the table to be ready to make his uh, presentation? Thank you. Okay, uh, DC 212161 is for the demolition of existing kennels and cattery buildings, oblique structures, and existing dwellings. Erection of 60 bed care home, class C2, and eight age restricted bungalows, class C3, with associated access, landscaping, and other works, including relocation existing Staddle Stone Barn. Can we please have the presentation? Can you turn the mic off? Oh, thanks. Hi, good afternoon, members. So please note, since publication of the committee agenda, a revised site plan has been received, and this secures an extra eight parking spaces to serve the care home, bringing the total to 31. That's four more spaces in the care home car park and another four along the drive. And each bungalow will continue to have two parking spaces. Also, there's been confirmation that two of the bungalows can be built to the requirements of M43 building regulations, and that's to make the bungalows wheelchair accessible. And also, finally, for clarification, there's a reference made in the committee report at paragraphs 6.84 and 6.85. That's in the summary of the highway matters. Um, just for clarification, it relates to an increase in traffic manoeuvres on the site because the Highway Authority has confirmed through evidence presented by the applicant that the proposal actually represents a reduction in overall vehicle trip generation. So on the slide currently, you can see that the site is in the parish of Washington on the north side of the A283 and east of the residential estate of Milford Grange. In planning policy terms, the site is in countryside adjacent to the South Downs National Park. The site is accessed from the A283. Old Clayton, a Grade 2 listed building, is south and outside of the application site, marked yellow on the slide. The buildings and structures shown on the aerial picture that are associated with the kennels business which is operating on the site, and also some of which are shown on the photographs on the slide, will be removed, and these are all single storey. The views on this slide are taken from the applicant's landscape appraisal. Shown is the site on the A283 with Old Clayton, so where my cursor is here. You can see the roof scape of Old Clayton listed building. To the west, the site is separated from Milford Grange Estate by a steep retaining wall, with the estate generally set lower than the site. And north of the site, where my cursor is here, is the Milford Grange Country Park. On more distant views, to the east are open fields, where my cursor is here. And in the countryside character, forms part of the setting of the qualities of the South Downs National Park. And then further still, from higher ground within the National Park, including the South Downs Way. These two last views here. 
So the new development will utilise the existing site access to be widened to allow two cars to pass. The new two-storey care home is set at the rear of the site in the northwest corner, the bungalows on the northeast, and they're arranged around the courtyard. The neighbourhood plan supports redevelopment of previously developed land in the countryside outside of the National Park. This is provided at course with other policies in the development plan. And the relevant text is highlighted there. So policy 18 of the HDPF, that's the Horsham District Planning Framework, allows for retirement and care accommodation outside the built-up area. That's provided it's accessible by public transport to local services. And policy 18 also encourages schemes that meet local needs. So your officers believe proposal calls with policy 18. As you can see from the slides, there's bus stops directly outside of the site and they provide access to services in Storrington, expectant of the demands generated by the development because obviously given the nature of future occupancy and the facilities to be available on site will tailor the demand for access to services in the village. There's also sufficient parking on the site to accommodate need and demand. Also the care and retirement accommodation offer as detailed on the slide is tailored to meeting local needs. And you can see on the slide of the floor plan facilities that are available in the care home. So the buildings on the site to be removed are generally low level historic and architectural interest. They only reinforce the special interest of the old Clayton, again marked yellow on the slide, only in a limited way. Its setting has already been compromised by buildings of the recent past. And you can see an example of this with the timber framed granary that's shown on the slide here. So this granary building will be retained and recited so there's a better appreciation of it within the development. And also the western entrance building will be removed to allow for the widened access, but it will be replaced with a gatehouse building to reflect the original access on the site. So just a bit more detail about the street scene, where you have the access redesign shown here. Uh, please do treat the CGI with some caution. The plan drawing here on the street scene is also a representation. We got the uh, continued appreciation of historic farmstead when viewed from the A283, which was on the advice of the council's conservation officer who raises no objection to the proposal. And in subject to operational considerations and conditions, the highway authority is also satisfied the development can operate safely and within capacity of the highway network. So as you'll be aware from the report, other schemes in the past have been refused on the site. But there's a comparison here, which demonstrates that those are of a very different style and form and layout to the current proposal. And then the impacts of the current proposal with site context and landscape sensitivities, that they've been thoroughly assessed by the council's landscape consultant architect and also the National Park Authority. And neither of these object. So there will be a degree of harm and bulk, sorry, a degree of harm arising from the bulk and the massing of the care home that's recognised by those consultees, particularly from views from the higher ground in the National Park and other vantage. But the adverse harm from that has been mitigated by negotiations on the landscape buffer in here, particularly on the east side, which is open to the field. So through negotiation, we now have a strong um, defensible boundary here and also to the south as well. So the cross sections you can see here, they demonstrate the relationship of the care home building with dwellings on Milford Grange. 
So whilst you can't deny that the care home will be visible to neighbours and their concerns are recognised, the distances and the building orientations do avoid an adverse impact on their amenities. And that includes concerns about overlooking and loss of privacy. So through continued negotiation and consultation, there is resolution through imposing the conditions on other environmental issues like ecology, drainage, and environmental protection impacts, including groundwater resources. And the proposals demonstrated it's water neutral and the proposed solutions endorsed by Natural England. So coming to the conclusion and applying the planning balance, Members will be aware the council can't demonstrate a five year housing supply and there is a shortfall of care accommodation in the district. Regard also needs to be given to the contributions made by the applicant to address accessibility and recreation yeah. pressures arising from the scheme. And overall, officers recommend the application be approved subject to conditions and legal agreement. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, first speaker, please, William Bedford, you have two minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I wish to object to the scheme as it currently stands. Uh, I live in Milford Grange, adjacent to the scheme uh, with my family. Our house is within 35 meters of the new proposed building. It's important to note that the level change between our site uh, and our estate is significant as five meters difference. Uh, that means that a two-story building there will be about the same as a four-story building located within a stone's throw of my house. Um, I've looked at the proposals very carefully. I've counted 10 windows, which would have a view of our bedroom window. I think, I think a few of them would have a very direct view from my window. I can sit in my bed and look out and see the evergreen trees behind the deciduous trees in the foreground. That building will be very visible and intervisible with our house. The planting that was shown on that profile there is not accurate because the trees they're proposing are deciduous in nature. The leaves will not be there in winter. In winter, you can see straight through them. And the fact of the matter is people will be able to see my wife and I in our bedroom. I'm not anti-development by nature. In fact, I act for developers professionally. And I know that there's no right to a view in planning, but I do have a right to not have my privacy violated and have people staring at me when I'm at home. At the minute, the screening proposed just doesn't do the job. They shouldn't be removing evergreen screening. The second point, well, the second point I want to make is about the listed building. There will be harm to that building. The buildings that are demolished in this proposal are curtilage listed. They form part of the fabric, uh, historic fabric of the listed building. And there is an effect to the setting, which will change from a distinctively rural one to a suburban one. If you read the conservation officer's comments carefully, you'll see that they recognize that there is harm, but the planning balance in the officer's report does not reflect that. And therefore the planning balance itself needs to be reconsidered to account for the harm, which is statutorily given uh, a lot of weight. Like I said, I'm not objected in principle to development. In fact, I'm not even objected in principle to development here, but it would have been nice if the developers had even knocked on my door or come to be proactively in touch with me. I've not heard anything from them. I had any letters from them, a phone call, nothing. I had an invitation to one open evening that I couldn't attend. Can you, can you, know. you conclude now, please? Well, I think I've made my point. Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Martin Hawthorne, please. You have two minutes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm the planning director at Highwood, the company who will be building this scheme if you grant permission. We as a company work very hard with your officers to address every single technical planning issue that has arisen throughout the 16 months since we submitted. Initially, we and our heritage expert work with your conservation officer to ensure that the fundamentals of our scheme accorded with and respected their views. This initial engagement set the overall approach for the scheme layout. We've spent a lot of time and effort since on the detail of the whole scheme and in particular the design, landscape and water neutrality. We're obviously very pleased that all this effort has resulted in not a single objection from any of the internal or external technical consultees. In particular, Natural England have confirmed that the proposal will be water neutral. 
We've also met with representatives of the Milford Grain Management Company and Mr. and, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Fordham, the immediate neighbours. We're very pleased that the Fordhams have written in support and indeed feel sufficiently strongly about the merits of our proposal to come to today's committee and speak in favour. Whilst the management company has objected, we have sought to address their concerns by, for example, employing specialists on technical engineering and making a significant contribution to the Milford Grange Country Park to address concerns about extra usage. As you'll hear from Barchester, and as detailed in the officer's report, there is an exceptional need for this form of accommodation. The officer's thorough report concludes this is a sustainable proposal that accords with policy 18 of your framework, which provides the guidance for this form of accommodation for older people. As you have seen from the report, your officers have undertaken a comprehensive planning balance exercise and, con con and concluded that the benefits arising from the scheme outweigh any harm. We therefore urge you to support the officer's recommendation for consent and approve this much needed scheme. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Phil Prosser, please. You have uh, two, two minutes, Mr. Prosser. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm speaking on behalf of Barchester Healthcare. Barchester that have over 260 homes throughout the UK and employ 18,000 staff caring for 14,000 residents. We offer nursing care, residential care, respite care, and care for people living with dementia and palliative care. We also support people with physical disabilities and complex neurological conditions. We are committed to the delivery of the care home of this site, having identified a significant need in the Storrington area. Our need assessment using industry recognised and CQC approved software reveals that there is a shortfall of 171 care bed spaces with ensuite wet rooms within a three mile radius of the site. This increases to some 322 bed spaces within, within a 20 minute drive of the site. Barchester will be providing dementia care with 50% of the home allocated to this pressing need. The last care home within five miles of the site was registered in 2009 with the earliest dating back to 1943. Storrington's older people deserve much better and the best way to increase consumer choice and raise standards across the board is by approving this development of modern purpose-built care homes to be run by reputable operators. Our architects has produced a scheme of the highest quality using sustainable building principles. For example, we'll be using air source heat pumps and providing other renewable sources of energy provision as standard. The amenity space for the care home designed to meet the particular needs of our residents. This will include a dementia walk with sensory planting, which is vital for residents' well-being. We will employ up to 70 members of staff, most of whom will be from the local area, and this is a major economic benefit of the scheme. Thank you for your time, and I urge you to support your officer's recommendation so that we can deliver this much-needed specialist accommodation for your local elderly population. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Colin Fordham, please. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Colin Fordham. I live at West Clayton Farm, which is the property most affected, in my opinion, by this planning application, as it immediately adjoins our property. And I'm here to represent the views of my wife and myself. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to support this, this proposal. Throughout the evolution of the planning application, I would, I would have met with me and my wife and kept us fully abreast of the progress of the application. During this time, they've taken account of our concerns about the effect it could have on our property and the wider environment. And where possible, um, I feel they modified the divines to alleviate these. And in a personal level, they put a particular emphasis on putting in extra measures in the fencing and the tree planting between our properties to maintain our privacy and assist wildlife and to make as little li limited impact on the wider environment as well. We believe it is rare to find a developer who is willing to listen and modify their proposals in this regard. Whilst we are on the good terms with the owners of the kennels, from a personal point of view, and I'm sure for many of the residents of the nearby housing estates, we were very pleased to no longer have the backlog of dog barking, but rather have a, a sustainable building which provides a much needed local resource. 
I've read many of the documents that have been available during the application progress and the committee report, and there is clearly a very urgent and significant need for this kind of supported housing in the environment. On a personal level, we took my father-in-law, who was 99, through an end-of-life process in the last six months, and it's extremely difficult to find reputable house, um, care homes in the local area, and Barchester are one of the best that we we could we would have used had we had the opportunity. It's my view this is a well-designed and attractive scheme, and as the immediate neighbour, I would urge you to support the officer recommendation and approve this application. Thank you very much. <clears throat> right, um, Anna Worthington Lease, Chairman of Stoughton Sunnington Parish Council, and also I believe you're going to talk on behalf of Washington or read, read a statement. So you have five minutes per, per presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, Washington have asked me to read out their statement as nobody was able to attend. Uh, Washington Parish Council strongly objects to this speculative proposal put forward at a time when there is no Horsham local plan in force. The site is not included for development in the Storrington, Sunnington and Washington neighbourhood plan. And by recommending approval, officers are seriously undermining the plan which has been adopted by Horsham District Council. Approval of this site would set a dangerous precedent for other speculative applications, notably Longbury Hill Woods in the parish, making them more difficult to resist. We are extremely concerned by the response from highways. Their observations consider potential traffic movements in isolation, with no joined up thinking in relation to Rampion's proposals for service roads opposite Hampers Lane and George's Lane, plus the looming rock quarry application all of which will put intolerable pressure on the already struggling A283 and Washington roundabout. In response to Rampion's first round of consultations, West Sussex County Council describes the A283 as a very busy high-speed rural road which does not have a good accident record. That came from a West Sussex County Council report to executive member proposed extension to Rampion offshore wind farm. In a letter to the Chair of Storrington and Sullington Parish Council dated the 27th of October 21, copied to Washington PC, Barbara Charles advises, National planning guidance sets a care home conversion rate from rooms to number of dwellings of 1.8. Therefore, a 60 bed care home is the equivalent of 33 homes. As the current application also includes eight bungalows, we have here a project equating to the building of 41 homes in the countryside, totally outside the neighbourhood plan. It should be noted that an application for 41 homes on this site was turned down on appeal in 2016. At a recent Washington Parish Council meeting, Councillor James Wright advised us that only strategic sites in the district were being included in the emerging local plan, focusing on those within neighbourhood plans, and none to this area to the south. Since then, the local plan has been put on hold for determination later this year, but the direction of travel seems clear. I hope we may rely on members to support the parish and neighbourhood plan by voting against the officer's recommendation. This would be a big deal for this area for all the reasons given here, and in our former letter of objection in 2021, and at the very least should be deferred until the new local plan is in place. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm now fine. I'm the chairman of the neighborhood plan steering group as well as the parish council. This application is recommended for approval despite the fact that two previous applications have been refused, one of which was also refused at appeal. I appreciate that this application is not for market housing, but the principles remain the same. The reasons for refusal by HDC were, one, it's in the countryside and not contiguous with the built up area boundary and would be detrimental to the character of the area. Two, it would harm the historic setting of Old Clayton and the experience of the heritage asset, which is currently within a predominantly isolated and rural landscape. Three, it would result in the loss of local employment opportunities. In refusing the appeal, the inspector commented that cumulatively with Milford Grange, the proposed development would appear as a prominent, isolated urban development in the countryside, remote from the built up form of Storrington. He concluded that the proposal was contrary to the HDPF 
and that the commercial non-viability of the site had not been demonstrated, nor was there any guarantee of its relocation. None of this has changed. This site is not included in the neighbourhood plan or the HGPF. It is contrary to policies 4 and 26 of the HGPF. I've seen no evidence to show that the current Kelms business is not viable. This argument was put forward previously as a reason for development of the site, yet it's continued to trade since the first application in 2010. For a business stated not to be viable to still be trading 13 years later leads me to question that statement. Have there been any attempts to market the business as an ongoing concern? I'm not aware of any. The loss of kennels would also constitute the loss of a valued local facility. I've seen nothing to imply that it would or could relocate locally. This seems not to have been taken into account. The site was in fact assessed under the neighbourhood plan procedure by HDC and the conclusion was that it was unsuitable for development for the following reasons. The site sits outside of the built up area of any local settlement with views across the South Downs National Park. There's a grade two listed building on the site. Development at this site would significantly impact upon the aims of the neighbourhood plan to retain the green gaps between Storrington and Washington. Grade two listed building on site in a countryside location away from services and facilities development would harm, result in harm to the rural landscape and the setting of the National Park. The conclusion of the assessment was this site is not considered appropriate for allocation in the plan. The neighbourhood plan postdates the HGPF, yet policy 18 now relied upon was not considered important at the time. In October 2021, we put it forward as an alternative site for additional housing in the new local plan, and it was reassessed by HDC officers. In a letter to me dated the 27th of October 2021, Barbara Charles stated, this site adjoins Milford Grange. It is, however, separated from the wider built form of Storrington and Sunnington by the country park to the north of the site and countryside to the east and west. The site is relatively distant to, from the services and facilities in Storrington or Washington, and pedestrian and cycle access to the site would need upgrades. The site also abuts the boundary of the National Park to the south and east. Milford Grange has predominantly been developed within a formal mineral site, and despite their proximity, the topography of the two sites is different. Old Clayton Kennels has been assessed as playing an important visual role as the landscape transitions from an urban form at Milford Grange to the attractive open rural landscape of the National Park that immediately abuts the eastern and southern boundaries of the site. Her conclusion, taking account of these factors, the officer assessment of the Old Clayton Kennels stroke Caffrey site remains as being less sustainable than other sites in the parish, given the combination of landscape, heritage assets and distance from services and facilities. She therefore declined to include it in the local plan. Again, none of these factors have changed yet. Somehow now apparently it is suitable. In the committee report, the officer concludes the proposal is not contrary to policy one of the neighbourhood plan. That policy was worded by HDC. And the intention was for the use of brownfield sites outside the built up area boundary that had not already been identified and assessed and as in this case dismissed. It is disingenuous to now reinterpret that policy to try and allow this development. It took several years and several tens of thousand pounds to produce the neighbourhood plan which was made in September 2019. Since then, there have been many attempts by HDC to undermine this plan, and this is yet another example. In order not to undermine both plans, this application should be refused as being premature as it's not included in either the neighbourhood plan or the HDPF. In a recent press release, the Cabinet Member for Planning, Lynn, stated, residents can now be clear that we are protecting the countryside and putting the needs of the now, local please? residents first protecting our open spaces and respecting neighbourhood plans. If this doesn't happen, I would like some explanation of what the point is of having a neighbourhood plan or a local plan, since both are being ignored here. Thank you. Thank you. Fine, thank you for those. Um, do the officers want to come back on anything? Yes? Yes, please. Okay. So yes, there was quite a lot to cover there. I just um, deal with the individual neighbours issues raised first. Uh, 
Um, so just going back to the sections, obviously these demonstrate the change in level and that's not um, denied by ourselves that there would be a, a visual impact from the building, but nonetheless, the distances between the care home building and those dwellings well exceed our back-to-back -back adopted distances. And the general rule of thumb is around 21 metres between back-to-back -back in a suburban environment. Here we've got to the north around 35 and to the west 41. So whilst the change in level would perhaps accentuate the perception and the visual impact of the building in terms of the actual shadow line cast and the sense of overbearing, it would be not adverse. In terms of the windows, there are windows at first floor in the care home, but because of a change in level, if you sort of roughly follow where my cursor is, it does mean that when you're in a scenario, when you're in the care home window looking out, it's not a direct level back to back relationship because you're either elevated above the housing. So you're looking down onto the properties on Milford Grange, or you're mostly focused in on the streets facing Milford Grange rather than the rear bedroom windows of the majority of the properties. So given that relationship and proximity, the views won't be considered to be intrusive to a degree where we could resist it from a planning application sense. So overall, we don't feel that there's unacceptable impact on amenity. In terms of the listed building and the points made about the degree of harm, So I, the listed building itself is off the site. It's the setting of which is going to be impacted by the removal of the buildings. And whilst the conservation officer recognises that some of those buildings do contribute to the notion of the farmstead setting of the listing, that has changed considerably over the recent time because a lot of these buildings are e much newer than the historic farmstead building, the former farmhouse of Old Clayton. So whilst the introduction of built form would change the setting, there are benefits in terms of the removal of a lot of those uh, later, more recent past buildings, which have compromised it. So it's a, it's a balancing act. And whilst there is reference to uh, setting in the conservation officer's comments. What is not made is an explicit um, statement of less than substantial harm. So we haven't even reached that level of that test of whether there's public benefits because the harm that's arising from this scheme hasn't got to that scale. The conservation officer is saying there is no harm sufficient enough on the heritage test. So we as officers are confident that the level of harm, the degree of harm doesn't warrant um, an issue of concern or refusal. Um, so in kind of responding back to the mm -hmm. parish's comments, particularly about the acceptance of this uh, type of tailored accommodation compared to general market housing. I will have to go back to their overarching policy. So this sets out where their direction of their neighbourhood plan is and towards development and the location of it and all other neighbourhood plan policies flow from this. So if there's a compliance with policy one, there's a compliance with a neighbourhood plan. And I will reiterate, as you can see on the highlighted text, that 
Whether this was the intention of the parish, nonetheless, we have to act on the wording that it exists as it is. And you will see that it does clearly state that development proposals outside of the built up area of Washington will be supported. So that's a very strong positive stance already. If it results in the reuse of previously developed land, which is the case here, on land outside of the national park, again applicable, provided the policy accords with other policies in the development plan. So the development plan includes a neighbourhood plan and the HDPF. What the neighbourhood plan doesn't do, is silent on, is providing allocations for retirement and care, specialist care accommodation. So the primacy of the policy is with the HDPF and policy 18. So again, we're back to the test is, sorry, the test is not the acceptability of general market housing in the countryside here. There is a different policy test for this very um, niche accommodation because the needs and reliance on local services by the nature of development is different because people aren't necessarily going into the village for daily shopping, for school, for jobs, because those occupants of this type of development will be having those services brought in or just not physically capable of taking that journey. So that's why there isn't that strong distinction made between market housing, which would is confined to built up area boundaries and um, this alternative type of accommodation where the test is more um, the suitability in relation to environmental considerations like landscape and other um, site context. In terms of the employment, obviously where we were before on the market housing, if I can show you the slide for comparison. So this is a scheme which went to appeal after refusal and was dismissed. And you can see that the red line, so the, app, the development, developable area on that site did include the list of building. And you can see that basically this scheme was a suburban estate layout overlaid and the context was wrong. It was inappropriate. That's why as officers, we didn't support it. And I look at it now and I agree with the conclusion of the inspector in relation to this. It is harmful. What we have here is a different approach because it's not looking for individual dwelling houses in a suburban layout. We've got a large, admittedly a large building because of operational constraints because of the care home, but it is sited adjacent to the um, residential estate. So there is a recognition that, sorry, it's moved away from that sensitive open field boundary, which was what identified by the inspector at the appeal decision. And instead there's a cluster of low rise bungalows trying to mimic a farmstead approach, which is relatively successful. Um, the care home building is large and the scale of that's acknowledged as an issue by the National Park Authority and the landscape architect. But there have been efforts to, to strengthen the buffers and mitigate the harm from the views both long distance and short. And overall, there's an acceptance that the building, although not exactly like the suburban estate next door, is not justifiably harmful. Um, so just on the employment side, the care home itself is bringing jobs, whereas the market housing on the appeal scheme provided none. So that, that's brought in the reason for refusal for loss of employment. Here we've got um, almost double the amount of jobs that are being provided. Um, and so there is a compliance with the employment policy. Uh, 
but I think that's generally covered most of it without repeating what's already explained in length on the committee report. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Um, right, local members, please. Councillor Dorf. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank officers for their help in answering specific questions and inquiries about this. They arranged a briefing for local members, which I think was extremely helpful. So I thought I'd preface my remarks by thanking officers from that point of view. Secondly, um, I have no personal experience of Barchester as a developer of this type of accommodation, these sorts of homes. I'm sure they're very good. Um, I would rather contest an argument that says it's going to be local staff, and I think the number mentioned was 80, when Care South, which is just along the road, also a nursing home, struggles desperately for staff from the local area. So staff have to come in from other areas. Um, in general, looking at this application, I have a number of concerns, which you already heard from Mrs Worthington Lees, who reminded us that this site was not part of the approved neighbourhood plan. My first concern is about the Bolko building in the countryside outside the settlement boundary. And I wonder if we could go back to the previous um, slide. Watch that one, please. Thank you. Um, and I quote here from a, uh, it's an immediately adjacent national park. And I'm going to quote, uh, I think it's essential, from the report on page 22 of what the South Downs National Park actually said. It made actually three contributions to this. On the 25th, on the first of all, on the 21st of oh, the 25th of October 21, it said the mass of the Western Care Home Block does raise concerns in terms of distant views from the higher ground to the south. In order to sit better into its context, development in this location to be broken down to a smaller scale elements. It basically repeated that um, in July of 22. Concerns were expressed with, the re with particular regard to the bulk massing of the proposed care home on the west side of the site when views from higher ground. In October, 6th of October 22, the South Downs National Park maintains a general concern with regard to the bulk massing of the proposed care home building on the west side. So the South Downs, so remember, this is immediately off, across the road from the South Downs National Park. I then like to move on to the comments by our conservation officer. I'll read those. From a heritage perspective, any new development on the site should reinforce a historical rural agricultural context to mitigate a sense of urban, suburban sprawl. Note that, mitigate a sense of suburban sprawl. It's important that the site continues to appear as a historic farmstead from the south when viewed from the A283. Although the design of the principal block seeks to reinforce a traditional agricultural character, the scale of the building will not be so convincing. Well, if that's not a concern, I don't know what it is. I'm amazed that the conservation officer doesn't think that it's very important or uh, we rather dismissed it rather easily. My second concern is that because it's situated in the countryside, 1.5 kilometers outside Storrington, there is no easy route into Storrington by foot. In fact, this is a very, very busy road. We have typically 18,000 cars a day going along that road. I note a comment by one objection mentions four recent traffic incidents at those that location. I can't verify that, but that was a comment made. And there's a need here for elderly people if they're going to use that public transport to cross this road to get the hourly bus into Storrington. And I stress it is only hourly. So I don't know how staff are going to get there uh, at all, but there we go. My other concern with this application this is the contrary to the neighborhood plan. It surely is contradictory that as a council, we've strongly supported parish councils getting in the neighborhood plans. Yet here we have a proposal to ignore this one. I know that officers have put pointers to the forward in the Storrington and Washington neighborhood plan, but that ignores the appendix, where as you, as you can see by the red markings on this assessment, the site was specifically rejected. I also mentioned that the presence, and in particular the setting of the grade two listed building seems to be very easily discounted. On a separate point, but I think it's highly relevant, at this time, this council's haunted progress on its local plan 
because we're waiting to see what Michael Gove intends as a result of his ministerial speech last month. There therefore seems an apparent contradiction in the council pausing its local plan and awaiting more on what additional strengths Michael Gove intends to give neighborhood plans, an application here that, as we have heard from Mrs. Worthington Lees, is contrary to the wishes of the, of the, of the um, neighborhood plan uh, committee. The design of the building, the bulk of the building, is clearly a long way from what our own conservation officer has said. And I quote again, it is important that the site continues to appear as an historic farmstead. Is that an historic farmstead? The officer says that this building will not be convincing. So for, the reason, for that reason alone, I believe the application should be rejected. However, I do possibly see that another approach should, see, should the committee so wish it is to delay determining the application as being premature, given that this council is awaiting further understanding of the proposals by the Secretary of State to give more power to neighborhood plans. Should the spectre now be raised of an appeal, I have in front of me the time scale supplied by office showing how long it takes for appeals at this size to be heard. And these have been taking a minimum of 39 weeks, i.e. 10 months, with many taking a lot longer. By the time that this council, and by that time, this council would, in my view, have a new local plan, and this site can be included or not. So in conclusion, Unless I hear a convincing argument otherwise, I think on balance we should reject this application as contrary to the neighbor plan, sitting outside the built up area, and a development given its bulk and size that is inappropriate for a rural location directly opposite the road from the National Park. And it was significant impact upon the aims of the neighborhood plan to obtain green gaps between mm -hmm. communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Councillor Gooch, nothing to say. Okay, Councillor Wright. Um, I mean, Councillor Dorr, as usual, uh, being the, the grandee that he is, covers all the salient points. Um, uh, this uh, has been kicking around for a long time. Obviously, the original application was put in uh, a long time ago, and the applicant is quite right that they have spent a lot of back and forth with um, officers to get the scheme to work. Um, Having uh, met residents from Milford Grange, uh, the community is divided about whether or not um, this is, is worth doing. And I think that's reflected in the officer's report in the balance of their decision. However, due to the fact that uh, there is a very clear steer from both uh, parish councils, from um, the residents who, who've spoken this evening, uh, this afternoon, I think it is clear that we need to um, take uh, Councillor Dawes um, response seriously, being it we delay or uh, reject based on the grounds that is outside of the uh, departure from the local development plan. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll open up the debate. Councillor Serkis. Um, to two things. One is uh, I'd like to endorse uh, the comments of Councillor Dorr in relation to those that were made by the Secretary of State in the House of Commons, um, where clearly the Secretary of State uh, is envisaging much more of an emphasis on community, uh, community decision making. And of course, what we've heard this afternoon is a very clear view from uh, the representative of the community concerned. Um, it, it does seem sensible, as Councillor Dorr has said, to wait, uh, as we're doing on the district plan, uh, to see what uh, consequences the changes to, changes to the levelling up bill might have on local plans, neighbourhood plans, as well as the district plan. The other point I wanted to make is in relation to the road. The point has been made quite rightly uh, that uh, this development would be some way out of Storrington. And uh, the relevant, uh, if one was getting a bus, the bus stop is on the other side of the road. Uh, and I'm sorry to report that when I was the county councillor for Storrington, um, this is when the development at Milford Grange took place. 
uh, and I had endless trouble uh, over the surfacing of the road there, but that's another issue. Um, but um, uh, and I had a letter from a uh, solicitor um, telling me that an elderly lady had gone from Mil Mil Milford Grange, was crossing the road to get catch the bus into Storrington and was run down and killed. Um, uh, and she felt that uh, further restrictions needed to be put on that road uh, because of the, the inherent danger of that road and the speed of traffic. So, I mean, there's a concrete example from my experience that supports the proposition that amongst the other factors that have been mentioned, uh, this road is uh, dangerous and unsuitable. Uh, and is a potential threat uh, to the interests and welfare uh, of future residents. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Emma, the um, Head of Development, wants to just come in here, I think. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to pick up on some of the comments regarding timescales and prematurity. Um, we, we can't reasonably hold a decision for, for an indefinite period of time until there may or may not be changes to the planning system. Obviously, what we've got at the moment is one consultation with further further uh, consultations to come. It's not a reasonable planning reason, nor is it a reasonable planning reason to delay a decision or make a decision on the basis that the inspector are taking ages to determine an application and policy may or may not be different at that time. It's not a reasonable reason. In fact, it's an unreasonable reason to do so. And that might put us in a difficult position if we were to proceed with appeal, an appeal. And we can't refuse the application on the basis of it's outside the built up area boundary because the policy enables it to be outside of the built up area boundary. And also we need to be mindful of our position with our five year supply as well. And, and you will be aware of the recent appeal decision that we've received. Um, my colleagues just got a couple of other bits to come back on if that's OK. Yes, Thank well. you. Bring it in now. Thank you. That's just on the more technical bits about the building design. So. As originally submitted, there was comments made about the flat roof and the attempts to try and avoid that and there has been some change as part of negotiation so where my cursor is here you can see it might be easier but, uh, yeah so where emma is uh, uh emma parks is pointing is to the sale lot feature which was part of um, an introduction to try and reduce the um, uniformity of the roof and the ridge. And there has been other um, adjustments made to it from the roof plan. So as well as you can see on the uh, care home building, there's been a breakup of the extensive roof with false Bridges to try and uh, move away from a very sort of institutional approach to the design. But obviously, a care home has got operational constraints to it. And the building form, like any care accommodation, follows the function of it and makes it extremely difficult to break up the mass for. Um, efficiencies and a successfully run care home because you need continuous corridor spaces, you need lift support, you need the rooms accessible to the corridor. Um, so the plan form that you see on the slide is typical of these buildings and it's unusual on a new development that's not a conversion of an existing building for there not to be compromise um, because a lot of it is necessary for the well-being of and the efficiencies of care so I can't see it being an opportunity to break up the care home building into say two separate buildings with a glass link because if you start introducing 
the extent of glaze in here, you move away from the very earthy tone of palette. You start bringing more light pollution in. So where is the opportunity to break up the building so substantially to reduce the massing and the bulk for and for it to still be an efficient care home as its function? It's very difficult to do that. Um, possibly you could bring some of the ease down in sections, but again, you start compromising bed space and there's an operational requirement for a successful nursing home to have a minimum and a number of bed spaces. So that's just an explanation to why the building is what it is and also how, despite commentary from the National Park, there hasn't been a substantial shift in the building plan form and the massing because it's a reflection of what's been uh, the typology and just the way the building functions. On the street scene, I'll just cover that very quickly because I know it was raised by Councillor Doyle. Uh, sorry, just go back to the correct slide. So this obviously was where the focus of the Conservation Officer comments came from about needing to keep the notion of the historic farmstead from the A283 because that's where most people appreciate the listed building, Old Clayton. So on the middle image, you can see that they've reinstated um, a gatehouse where the existing later addition, which is one of the least historic curtilage listed buildings on the site, is going to be removed to allow for safe access. But they have recognised that and they are forming a punctuation building there to enclose that space again. So again, that's a response to identified heritage benefit. Um, and also, again, you do have to take the CGIs with caution, but you can see that the care home building is, the, one of the wings of it is set well back from the street scene. So it's appreciable from, a point of view in terms of retaining these uh, street frontage buildings and the idea of this being the farmstead and as you move further in then you will get large barn structures of a different scale where you would have higher ridges because they need that for again this agricultural function so um i, I think what has happened is there is a reinterpretation of what was being trying to achieve there in terms of historic farmstead and our conservation officer is satisfied that they have done that approach correctly. Okay, thank you Matthew. Right, coming back to the floor, Councillor Croker. Thank you Chair, um, I've got a question. Uh, a comment and probably the reason I won't be supporting this application today. Uh, start with the easy one. The question, uh, paragraph 680 refers to 445 vehicle movements per day existing. Is that a typo? It might be easier if we should prepare to answer that one straight off. Um, so that figure there has come from the applicant's own evidence and it's not disputed by the Highway Authority. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the comment is with regard to paragraph 680, um, where the report specifies that acoustic glazing and the two and a half metre high acoustic fence to the southern boundary are needed. Um, I believe there should also be mechanical ventilation in there for nighttime noise uh, within the building. Again, uh, not necessarily a comment, but um, just make that point. Um, I think there's something missing there. Uh, and the reason I'm not happy with the application is with regard to water neutrality. Um, and in particular, the way that the consumption of water at the Red Oaks care home has been calculated. 
I'm afraid this gets slightly technical. I'll try and keep it simple. Um, Part G of building regulations are concerned with estimating the water consumption of new dwellings. As such, it gives a conservative estimate, which is on the high side. And if you look at the way it's calculated, um, where you have multiple fittings, and that's what's being used in the water neutrality report, uh, we've got 12 shower heads, uh, different flow rates. Um, and the way the calculation is done, um, you calculate an average, but you also look at the highest shower head, highest flow shower head, uh, multiply that number by 0 0.7, and you then use either the average of all the fittings you're going to use or that, or the 0 0.7 times highest shower head number. You use the highest of those two. So it gives you a high side estimate. It's a conservative estimate. This building is going to produce this amount of water. However, for water neutrality, in order to get certainty, you need what I'd call a low side estimate of the water consumption. Um, and basically, this hasn't been done. And for example, if you just use the average of these fittings, uh, you end up something like five to 700 litres per day short in terms of the offsetting amount. So I believe there's a technical error that's been applied uh, and I can't support the application for that reason alone. Um, obviously it's something that uh, a deferment would give the applicant time to sort out, but um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chairman. My point's a much more minor point than that one, which is far more important. But um, under paragraph 6.64, um, basically it talks about the difference, the differential in height between the houses of Milford Grange and the proposed uh, nursing home. And in it, in, in this paragraph, it says, and I quote, um, direct unobstructed views of a penetrative nature into the private rooms of neighbors will be avoided for the most part goes on to say, on this matter, there's a large number of glazing openings for the care home building facing north with consequential pressure to ensure adequate outlook and minimize tree planting for mitigation screening. Now, one um, submission or document from Mr. Bedford shows photographs from his house looking towards the proposed site, looking at the bank. I think it was Mr. Bedford, well, from, mm. from somebody anyway. Um, and it's proposed to take down the conifers and replace them with birch or other deciduous trees. Now, deciduous trees work fine in the summer, but in the winter, they have no screening or very little screening value at all. So if committee was minded to approve this planning application, I would certainly want a condition inserted talking about the planting or modifying the planting to put in more, substan more substantial screening than just mm -hmm. deciduous trees. Because as I said, deciduous trees don't screen anything in the winter. And in the winter, they need proper screening from the individual houses that are affected. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Any other council? Councillor Van der Kooch. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I give a belated um, declaration of interest? I do apologise. I should have done it at the outset. I am a member of the South Downs National Park Authority. Um, and I, I do note that the South Downs National Park has concerns about the bulk of this building, uh, as indeed I, I do have concerns myself about it. I, I, I fully understand the officer's explanation that it is really inherent in, in this type of uh, building, a uh, purpose of the building, the care home, that it, that it needs continuous corridors and so on. So Maybe the question is whether the site is suitable for this, um, uh, for, for a care home. The other point I wanted to, to raise was just to take up the point my colleague, <clears throat> Councillor Clark, made. I was going to make that very same point myself about a uh, point of detail under paragraph 6.64. Um, I, I noted that, um, you know, there was a concern about the vicinity of the proposed building to the Milford Grange housing 
um, and, and the need to, 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 to keep some sort of screening. And then it talks about actually taking down the conifers and replacing them with birch. And I thought that was very odd because of the very point that Councillor Clark made that birches shed their leaves in winter, so there would be no adequate screening. But I can see that the way it's written, it's written from the point of view of the occupants of the of the care home, that they have a have a have a have a nice view out of the window. But what it hasn't taken into account, of course, is the point that uh, one of the speakers, uh, Mr. Bedford, made, which was that. Um, you know, people from the care home would be able to therefore look straight into the, his bedroom window. And so uh, I would agree with Councillor Clark that if we were minded to approve this application, there should be some condition that the those trees on that boundary, wherever it is, I think it might be on the north side, I'm not sure, um, should remain evergreen. Maybe it just needs the current trees um lot so that they are um not so high but but they do need to be evergreen to provide some sort of screening for the benefit of the the occupants of the houses of Mil milford grange um thank you chair thank you okay anybody else oh, sorry council chairman well thank you chairman and i also have to apologize for a related um uh, acknowledgement that I am a West Sussex County Councillor uh, and therefore the comments were made in the report about highways. Uh, however, I, I, could I just make a, a few comments and questions? Uh, firstly, I totally agree with this comment about overlooking uh, the neighbouring properties. And if we could ask the officer to uh, display again on the screen uh, the sections, just so that we may understand it. Uh, the, forgive my eyesight here, it's all very small. But the top uh, figure shows the flank of the new building. Yes, is that right? The new care home in brown. Is that right? Yes. And the area, sort of, shall we say, grey, is that an existing building or is that what? No, what, what you can see on the top is the cross section. So that's the through the width of the care home building. So the grey bit is. The other wing so okay you, right so okay. like a, a slice of cake okay and, and if i may just ask us this question of immediately the trees that are being shown on the left look very healthy uh specimens um but as we've been pointed out that they probably i'm not quite sure whether they're that uh section accurately uh, uh illustrates the height of those trees uh, perhaps you might like to comment on that or is that an artist's impression i would you say the purpose of the cross section is to show accurately the relationship and the height between the care home building and the buildings on Milford Grange. Not so not in which we should, we should take those trees with a pinch of salt or completely ignore them. Is that right? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's quite relevant. Um, and if this council is minded to give a consent to it, I, I agree that we really do need beefing up any uh, amenity there. Um, it is possible to uh, acquire trees of some considerable height uh, to be planted, and I know other people do that. Whether or not they do it at Developments for Care Homes, I don't know, but it's something that is possible uh, that can be acquired and will be a relatively small sum of money for the developer of a scheme of this size. Could I then take you on very quickly uh, to the question of uh, demand for care homes? My understanding is that a uh, care home market is quite well provided in West Sussex. One of the problems we have, though, is we have a lack of what is known as independent living accommodation for people when they get to a certain age or disability. That is why I was very pleased to see that eight bungalows. Is it eight bungalows that are uh, uh, proposed for this scheme? Um, you may have heard me in previous meetings. I very much uh, welcome the provision of bungalows uh, throughout our district because we do have a demand for them. I was disappointed, however, uh, with the comment that was made earlier on that the negotiations, and negotiations is a word that we've heard a lot about today in the presentation and also in this report. I like discussions rather than negotiations, it sounds as though we're doing deals. Um, on the 
there's only two of these bungalows subsequent to the application coming in that will be wheelchair friendly, shall we say, access friendly. I'm disappointed that only two of those eight are, are that uh, are so suitably specified. And if this council was minded uh, to grant planning consent for this, I would hope that that would be something uh, that we could insert into any conditions. And could I then take you on very quickly to the sustainable transport 6.81? I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong, but I'm not quite sure that we've got a 24 hour bus service running along this road. Is, is that right? Um, and therefore, this report is perhaps giving us a false impression about the accessibility of this uh, care home. Uh, we do know uh, that uh, salaries uh, for staff at care homes are not the highest. And therefore, uh, I'd imagine that if they are to be the staff, if they are to live locally, they may well want to take advantage of buses in order to get to their place of work and also people visiting their relatives in them. So I'm not quite sure the report is shows, uh, I think it shows a too favorable light on that particular aspect. And um, forgive me, I think I will leave it there. Thank you, but I'd be interested in the officer's comments. Thank you very much. Would you like to come back on that? Yep, so in terms of the issue about trees, um, as background to why the conifers that exist there are being suggested to be removed is partly to do with the appropriateness of them in terms of the relationship with the new care home because the care home residents are going to be largely bed dependent or at least in their rooms for much longer than family housing occupiers and the windows all face north there was um, a discussion around whether the continuation of having the conifers there would in fact impede the outlook and the enjoyment for the nursing home residents. So that's why it's been suggested that they be removed and replaced with silver birch. I mean, the point is that irrespective of whether the trees screening is proposed or not, the back-to-back -back window distance exceeds our rule of thumb uh, guidance it's 41 meters to the north where the rule of thumb is 20 meters um so if in the scenario there was going to be any trees at all we as officers would still be saying the overlooking would be acceptable um nonetheless there probably is scope there to uh look again at the trees planting um, it would certainly help with the screening of the building itself as well. Um, and there's opportunity there to put in more evergreen and conifer species. Um, that's something that we've got a condition on for the final planting scheme, which we can uh, feed into that. On the uh, wheelchair accessibility, so what we have to be mindful of is that we don't have a policy which requires M43 or uh, that particular tailored accommodation type within our local plan at the moment. Um, we are getting an offer of two. It's not all of them, but that's more that's above and beyond the policy requirement. Um, and part of it is driven by the need to um, provide for a tailored type of accommodation to meet policy 18 and the local needs. So um, it is difficult to say that all eight should be M43 in the silence of the policy. Um, and have been there was a request to make all eight M43, but um, due to the market demand, that was presented by the applicant, they felt that they couldn't offer it to all eight, but to uh, certainly to two, which is more than the policy requirement, as I said. There was mention about the water neutrality. Um, we got headroom for this scheme. It's, I don't have the figure in front of me, but 
it is sufficient to allow for different types of fixtures to go in. So whether or not the Part G has been um, scrutinised as the way the councillor would have expected it to be demonstrated, if there was a change in fixtures and fittings, then there was still enough headroom there to allow for that and for the scheme to still be water neutral. It doesn't fundamentally undermine the solution and natural England themselves have independently looked at the data and haven't raised concern about how the part G was demonstrated in the evidence. So um, the scheme is still robust because it has that headroom to allow for changing fixtures. Uh, there's also one mention about the acoustic fence on the southern boundary, just to show I might have the same problem with the cursor, but basically it's the boundary with West Clayton and the application site. So it's not saying to the southern boundary along the roadside, it's uh, between those two properties. So you would see that, well, you wouldn't be able to see that from the, the road anyway, but even if you could get a glance of it, it will be in the context of West Clayton and the domestic paraphernalia with that and the tree uh, screening that's going along the southern boundary anyway. So I don't feel there's a visual impact from that need for that acoustic fence. Thank you. Can I just pick up on a point? Um, the headroom that you've got for the water neutrality, um, is that sufficient to meet the shortfall that uh, Councillor Croker quoted, which I think five to 700 litres, was it? Yeah, I don't have the details in front of me to be able to calculate that today. Right, so we don't know that at the moment. Okay, fine. Any other councillor want to? Councillor Chuck. Sorry, Chairman, I'd forgotten my other point um, in my excitement earlier. Um, 1.6, uh, part of your negotiations with the developers, uh, I see they propose to offer six weeks of marketing and all the bungalows exclusively to those residing in the local parishes. Is six weeks all that we can get on this particular thing? Six weeks goes in the bat of an eyelid. And uh, I, I really do think that's a very minimal period. And secondly, there's no comment about when that marketing begins, whether or not it's when the buildings are close to uh, uh, completion or what have you, all relevant points. And I would like, if this council is amend, uh, minded to grant planning consent, that there be a more suitable and reasonable period of marketing and or specify when it should begin. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the detail of the legal agreements is ongoing, hasn't been finalised. So we can put the trigger point in to the marketing and continue discussions around how long that marketing period is. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lambert. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I suppose I should have um, said a conflict of interest right at the beginning. My mother is in a Barchester, which brings me on to that if we are minded to approve this, evergreen trees along that perimeter would make no difference whatsoever. She spends very little time in her room. Barchesters have lots of activities. She spends most of her time out with the others in activities. She only gets into her room to sleep, so she wouldn't be standing in a room walking out the window. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other councillor before we go to the side? Okay, in that case, then the proposal or the recommendation is that uh, to approve full planning permission subject to appropriate conditions and the completion of section 106 legal agreement. Um, I don't know whether any councillors want to bring in any. Uh... Oh, sorry, Croker, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, in view of my comments about mm -hmm. water neutrality, I believe we should be deferring this application until that can be sorted out because it, it's a significant point. This is going to come up time and time again. And unless we get this hammered out, um, you know, I'm going to be saying this at every planning meeting. So I prefer, propose a deferment to sort out the water neutrality 
Well, before we decide on that, we've already heard from the head of development on that. Do you want to? Well, well I think I think. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman. I think Councillor <clears throat> Croker has a has a has a fair point, and obviously we're not able to answer that. We don't have all of the details of the technical details before us today, so it is open to members to defer it. <laughs> Equally, it is open to members to perhaps delegate approval subject to further consideration of water neutrality in the comments you've raised in consultation with however you see relevant. It is an alternative option, but it, obviously that's up to you as a member in terms of what alternative motion if any you would wish to put forward thank you it's quite strong to suggest a moment so i would actually ask has he got us to do a planning off suspension before today because he's so strong he should really have done that <clears throat> just be reminded as this is a very strong point that you're bringing up have you brought this to the attention of the planners prior to the meeting uh, I have to apologise for not doing that. Uh, it basically, it took me about three hours yesterday okay. working through this to actually find the way this had been calculated because I wasn't specifically looking for it. Uh, so, yes, I apologise to officers from that point of view. But I think it is still a significant point. Um, so, let me just uh, discuss with your mind. I, mean, I, I would agree with the suggestions from the head. The head of development um my best suggestion would be that you um delegate it for them to consider it further and either it can be resolved or if it really can't be resolved you would then bring it back and back Are you happy with that uh, no i don't think i am chair i'm sorry um, for what reason Thing is we have to resolve this in one way or another and uh you've you've made a valid point and uh sonia has uh, also come back with with her reasoning as to why we should do it that particular way okay i, I i'll accept the legal advice then okay so can you could you uh, perhaps put so, forward so, an alternative? So my understanding is the motion is that we delegate approval or subject to the further consideration of water neutrality. Um, is that just to offices, Councillor Croker, or is that in consultation with anybody else? Uh, in consultation with local members. Okay. Okay, that's a proposal. That's it. Okay, so we need a seconder for that if we could. Point of order, it's a point of order. I mean, I thought uh, in, in this sort of situation, when it's delegated, it's delegated with a view to mm -hmm. uh, approval or whatever. I rather suspect that Councillor Croker feels uh, that uh, even if the issue, I'm, I, I'm sorry if I'm putting words in your mouth. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think Councillor Croker feels that even if the issue of water neutrality is dealt with, there are other profound objections. And so I think uh, Councillor Croker would be um, a little bit disappointed if, if one issue was resolved to the satisfaction of officers without that issue coming back uh, and without uh, consideration of the other issues with which I know, looking around the table, members are unhappy about. Okay. Just, just to say, okay. Councillor Circus, if if obviously this is a motion put forward, you know, if if the motion is to de delegate it, you're right, it would be with a view to approval, but, but even in deferring it, you can't bring it back and discuss all the other matters. And if there are other matters, this needs to be considered today. Obviously, a motion has been put forward, and that would be what we then vote on. Um, but that that effectively means that members are satisfied with the other matters. Okay, excuse me a minute. Wouldn't it really be better just to go back to the original thing and they just vote very, very much of the way we don't? Because it can get complicated. There's so many variations. My understanding of what Councillor Croker was saying was that it was on that one issue only that he was objecting. And it, apart from that, you were happy with the recommendation to approve. So that's point number one. And point number two, my response um, to Councillor Circus is that um, the debate hadn't gone beyond that. So we hadn't really finished. 
and I think it's open to the floor mm. to discuss whether there are any other points that you're unhappy with. Um, and then those can be dealt with any um, proposals or, or you can just thrash that out. I don't think we'd finished the discussion yet and we, we weren't going to only deal with uh, Councillor Croker's no. opinions. Everybody needs to say whether they're happy with the recommendation or whether they've got any alternative proposals. And then we'll just have to work out which ones we deal with in what order. No. Uh, right. I'm confused. Like everybody else, I think. Yes. In so, which case, Chair, I, I, I will withdraw that motion. Um, and right. so we go back to the original, uh, the substantive uh, recommendation, which was to approve planning permission, and then we go on a straight yeah. vote. Would that be the better way to deal with it? That's it. No one if you're happy with that, does anybody else have any uh, proposal that, or motion that they want to put forward instead of the one that's recommended here? Councillor Clark. So on a note of. Uh, Whatever the result is of the vote, we'd still like to hear about the water neutrality calculations. That, I think, is a fair comment. Yeah, I agree. Well, in that case, then, I think we'll go back to the original recommendation, which is to approve full planning permission subject to appropriate conditions and the completion of a Section 106 legal agreement. In the event that the legal agreement is not completed within three months of the decision of this committee, the director of place is authorised to refuse permission on the grounds of failure to secure the obligations necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms. So can I have uh, hands for all of those in favour of the recommendation by the officers? Okay. Right. Of course, I've got to go to mine. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay. All those against? And any abstentions? One, two, three. Yeah. Councillor Nolan can't yeah, vote. No, that's no, right. Yeah, no. we've not taken this. So in that case, it's okay. So um, planning applications. Are so we've had um, uh, two votes for, ten against, and three abstentions. No, we voted against the original recommendation. Yeah, that doesn't use it. We need to introduce the motion. So what we're going to use it on. Oh, I see. Okay. I'll check all, further it or whatever. All right. Okay. okay. It's been rightfully pointed out to me that although we've... Um... Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Councillor Blackall. Thank you. Um, we need an alternative motion from uh, maybe local members or somebody who, uh, as to the reasons why we've refused it. Can I, Thank you. Can I read out something? Yes. Sonia's going to do something for us. The planning protocol you have, um, if I may read it, it says make sure if you are proposing seconding or supporting decision, contrary to officer recommendations or to the local development plan, that you clearly identify and understand the material planning considerations leading to this conclusion and decision. These reasons must be given prior to the vote and be recorded. So that's prior to the vote that you're going to be asked to take in a second, um, which is presumably somebody's get, going to propose and second that this application be refused. So prior to that vote, you have to give your planning reasons for making your decision to vote in that way. Be aware that in these circumstances, the member may have to justify the resulting decision by giving evidence in the in the event of any challenge. But... Okay, right. Councillor Dorr, do you want to put up? Uh, uh, um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to what, what I said originally. Um, there I said, and um, I, I, I wait proper to correct me if any of this doesn't add up. I said we should reject the application as contrary to the neighbourhood plan sitting outside the built-up area and a development given its bulk and size as inappropriate for a rural location directly across the road from the National Park, and which would significantly impact upon the aims of the neighbourhood plan to retain green gaps between communities. Um, I, I do have significant concerns 
regarding quoting it's outside of the built up area boundary and contrary to neighbourhood plan, bearing in mind the wording of neighbourhood plan policy one and the wording of policy 18, which allows effectively care homes outside of built up area boundaries. So I don't think it is contrary to the development plan in that respect. Clearly, the scale and bulk of the building and the impact it have on its setting and the countryside is, is more a matter of judgment. But I would raise caution to, to the first part of, of your suggestion, Councillor Dorr. Well, I'm sorry, but the neighbourhood plan specifically rejected the site. Now, because there is a forward which was written by officers of this council, which I think is loosely can be loosely interpreted as allowing anything in the countryside if it's on a brownfield site, I don't think that gets away with, the, with it at all. I think it is contrary to the neighbourhood plan. It's quite clearly, if one looks at the appendix of the neighbourhood plan, it is actually refused. It actually, uh, actually, uh, it, the wording is that it is not suitable. Now, if the wording said it's not suitable, the wording said it's not suitable. It's a specific site that's been looked at. So to me, yeah, if there is general wording, that talks about something coming up in the countryside that is it is is a brown built site. Yes, you can build on it, but when it's specifically looked at and rejected, that is not the same thing. It, uh, clearly, it's a member for decisions. Um, just in a couple of points, it's not the forward. It's actually policy one of the neighbourhood plan, which you can see before you here on the screen. And the second point is the previous assessments of the site have been on the basis of market housing. This is not market housing, but I won't say any more. And clearly that decision rests with members. Thank you. Thank you for that. Emma. Do you want to add anything to that? OK. In that case, Councillor, can you please reread your, your motion, if you wouldn't mind? Sorry. Um, well, what reading, uh, Chairman, what I said before? Or, yeah. okay. Yes, just, just what your motion is. We should re reject this application as contrary to the neighbourhood plan, sitting outside the built up area, and a development giving its bulk and size that is inappropriate for the rural location directly across the road from the National Park and which will significantly impact upon the aims of the neighbourhood plan to train green, green gaps between communities. Um, that, that, okay. that was what I've got here anyway. Thank you for that. Do you have a seconder? Somebody willing to second that? Councillor Clark? Well, I mean, we'd also, as we are looking for reasons for turning, for um, voting on this, for also that the water neutrality um, in in the mind of members has not been proven satisfactorily and it is a matter of concern for the members in view of the legal um, ramifications if we get it wrong. Councillor Dort would have to add that to his motion yeah. if he wishes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, you're happy to do that. Okay, are you going to second the motion then? Yes. Thank you very much. So mindful of what um, the head of development has said, um, could members uh, now please vote on the on the amendment that's been proposed by Councillor Dorr? Thank you. So all those in favour? All those against? Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. So we had a nine four, four against, and two abstentions. Therefore, the motion is carried. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we just move on now. Yeah. Okay. okay. I know. I know. Um, OK, before we move on to item seven on the agenda, which is uh, DC 220695. Um, could Alan Heckworth please step up? To the table, thank you. Could you leave as quietly as possible, please, because we need to move on. Thank you. 
Can we get to the table? Thank you. Fine. We'll move on to item seven, uh, which is uh, DC 220695. This has been deferred from the Planning Committee on the 18th of October 22 to allow for additional information to be submitted and is for the change of use of a barn, stables, equestrian to sui generis to form new gaming processing workshop. Can we have the officer presentation, please, tomorrow? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, yes, this application has returned to committee following deferral in October. Uh, where the resolution sought the submission of further information in the form of a noise assessment and updated water neutrality statement. The application, the, sorry, the applicant has provided this information and this has been subject to public consultation and consultation with the Environmental Health Officer and Natural England. Since the publication of the committee report, two additional letters of support have been received and additional comments have also been received from the Environmental Health Officer outlining that deliveries and activities during the night or early morning would not be supported due to the significantly reduced level of road tra traffic on the A24 at night. Uh, so this is the application site as represented by the red outline and shading, and it is located to the east of the A24 outside of any defined built up area boundary. The site is therefore within the countryside in policy terms. The wider site comprises a number of agricultural buildings used as part of a for former dairy farm located immediately to the south of the subject building, with a cluster of converted barns now used as residential dwellings located 30 metres to the southwest. Several other residential properties are located to the north of the track and adjacent to the access entrance. Uh, so the aerial photograph shows the location of the site within the context of the surrounding properties and wider countryside. Uh, the application site would be accessed from the existing entrance off the A24, with the site plan indicating that the access track, which passes between the residential dwellings and former dairy buildings, would be utilised by the development. Alterations would be made to the track, with the portion between the residential properties and dairy buildings resited further to the east. The track would also be widened to the north to provide a turning head, with parking proposed to the northeastern corner of the building. Following the previous committee referral, the applicant has submitted a noise assessment to address the neighbour amenity concerns. The assessment outlines that the dominant noise source is the A24, which passes to the west of the site and is clearly audible from the application site and entrance. The noise associated with the development is impacted by this existing noise source, and the assessment outlines that noise caused by vehicle traffic to and from the application site would be no greater than the noise experience from the road traffic using the A24. The assessment concludes that the development is unlikely to have a significant impact on the soundscape. And that the environmental health officer has reviewed the assessment and agrees with the methodology undertaken and the conclusions reached. So these are the existing plans and elevations of the subject buildings. And they show the, the principal building and uh, a, a former storage building. Uh, it is noted, as previously, that the building uh, the building works have commenced and the business is operating from the site. Uh, so here's the proposed, showing the limited external alterations to the subject building with internal works undertaken to provide necessary areas for the operation, including processing areas for birds and venison, freezer and chiller spaces and staff mess accommodation. Uh, this floor plan also shows the location of the external condenser units. The noise assessment has identified that the main sound sources are these units, with the external extraction associated with the plucker uh, also being an additional noise source. Following sound measuring, the commercial sound sources were found to not exceed the daily daytime noise levels, but do exceed residual background noise level in the nighttime period. And the assessment concludes that this could be overcome by upgrading the enclosures surrounding the plant, specifically the freezer, condenser and plucker enclosure, and this is accepted by the Council's Environmental Health Officer. A scheme to address this, up, to address this upgrading is recommended under Condition 4. 
So this photo shows the context of the site, including the, the relationship with the subject building and the nearby residential properties. Uh, the water neutrality statement submitted identifies the water, that uh, the water demand arising from the development and proposes off-site mitigation measures through the installation of flow restrictors to taps within five dwellings. So this photograph shows four of those five properties, which I identified to be retrofitted as part of the water strategy, with the fifth property known as the cart shed located approximately 20 metres to the south of this photo. These all fall under the same ownership, freehold ownership. Uh, the statement has been supported by water bills confirming the existing water consumption of each of the dwellings, along with Part G water calculators indicating the reduced consumption resulting from the installation of flow restrictors. The Council have undertaken an appropriate assessment where it has been concluded that the proposed measures would result in a total reduction that would be greater than the demand arising from the development. It has therefore been shown that the development would be water neutral. Natural England have been consulted on the appropriate assessment and have raised no objections subject to the mitigation measures being secured. The recommendation is subject to the completion of a section 106 agreement, which would secure these mitigation measures in perpetuity. So it is recognised that Chanctonbury Game offers an important service for the rural community with associated economic and public benefits. The proposed development would result in social and economic benefits and would support and contribute to the wider rural economy. This is considered to be a material consideration of significant weight. The proposal would be located within an established building suitable for conversion and would sustain the countryside based enterprise without resulting in adverse impact on the highway network or the immunity of neighbouring properties. For these reasons, the proposed development is considered acceptable. The applicant has submitted additional information in the form of the noise assessment and updated water neutrality statement to address the concerns previously raised. The noise assessment has confirmed that the operation and associated activities would not result in significant noise, particularly given the background noise experience from the A24. Subject to conditions, it is considered that the proposal would not result in a level of harm to the amenities of neighbouring properties, which would warrant a refusal of the application. The proposed water strategy, which includes offsetting to five residential dwellings, is considered to address the water demand arising from the development, and this would be secured by a Section 106 agreement. Subject to this mitigation, the development would not contribute to an existing adverse effect upon the integrity of the internationally designated Aran Valley sites. For these reasons, it is considered that the development is, is acceptable in accordance with the relevant development plan policies and subject to conditions listed within the report and a Section 106 agreement to secure the water strategy in perpetuity. Thanks. Thank you, Tamara. Fine. So, uh, Mr. Hepworth, you have two minutes. Councillors, I would like to address you this afternoon regarding the water neutrality aspects of this application. The starting point is that both Natural England and this council are very clear that proposals can only be approved where you are certain that the proposal is water neutral in perpetuity. <clears throat> Indeed, Natural England's advice in this case expressly requires the water neutrality to be secured in perpetuity. <clears throat> this proposal completely fails to do that. We're told this is the only game processing business left in Sussex. We're told it's important to help control a, a growing deer population, a rapidly growing deer population. And the applicant has always said that its move to Whit Woodman's will help it grow its business. A growing business will require more staff. More staff will use more water. The applicant says it has five employees today. Its proposed offsetting measures are sufficient, just, to offset the water usage of those five employees. There is no headroom at all. And there are no offsetting measures proposed for any additional employees in future. So if the business grows at all and any additional people are hired, even just one, the proposal will no longer be water neutral in the future. Given what we're told about this business, it's highly likely that it will grow and more people will be hired. It's most definitely possible. And if it's even possible, you cannot be certain that the proposal is water neutral in perpetuity. 
Being water neutral today is not enough. If this council is to be faithful to its publicly stated position that applicants applications will only be approved where there is certainty that they are water neutral in perpetuity, then this application must be refused. Thank you very much. Bang on time too, well done. Okay, uh, I think Marion Nash wants to go next, is that right? You have two minutes. You've already rejected this application last January on loss of immunity and high risk safety grounds for the very applicant's in-group traffic. The applicant has produced nothing to say that justifies the different decision today. In practice, the traffic is of a completely different magnitude than anything that either was or could have been generated by any community of use. As two of these producers, the hobby rate group stable produced very little traffic. The stables used by the ponies of up to five farm tenants, all who had to live on site, didn't and couldn't generate traffic because they didn't drive the success ponies, they walked. And the stables use isn't a viable fallback anyway because it was abandoned when the stables were replaced with an app. It's machinery and reverting to farm use for the barn wouldn't generate more traffic either. That traffic would continue as it does today, just using one more barn. On the current use in stock contrast, the applicant's business generates huge traffic. We regularly see, regularly see, between 30 and 50 in and out movements a day, all passing within three meters of our front door. At least three times more than the maximum they contained. We put in sworn evidence for that, which the planners have chosen to ignore. The traffic also includes substantial retail traffic, which is no surprise when they are openly telling their customers on Facebook to collect their purchases from the bar. There's late night and early morning traffic, which the Council for Environmental Health has expressly said they don't support. This, of course, will only get worse as the business grows. It can be the basics for the community. It hugely increases the risk of an accident at the junction with the main road. This application remains an attempt to force a square peg into a round hole. The top of the value of the business which remains the wrong site for it. Thank you. Okay, um, Heather Norton. You have two minutes. The third major problem with this application is the wet menu of hours of use and mission. The applicant's traffic passes in close proximity to a number of residential properties, and it is just one of them. Every single vehicle. I just interrupt. Have you got your mic microphone on? Is it is it red? No. Okay. If you could press the button. The speaking button. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's fine. I mean, we heard the first bit. So. That's Thank it. You. Fine. Thank you. The applicant's traffic passes in close proximity to a number of residential properties. Ours is just one of them. Every single vehicle going to and from the factory passes within three metres of our front door and our bedroom. And their traffic is relentless, seven days a week, at all hours of the day and night. Our privacy is constantly invaded as drivers knock on our door or drive into our garden looking for what they call the venison shop or the slaughterhouse. It's not the driver's fault, but it drives us mad. The planners say this can be made acceptable by restricting the hours of use. But the applicant has said in writing it cannot comply with the suggested hours because their hours are dictated by the times and demands of the shooting world. Those times and demands won't change. So the applicant isn't able to change its hours, even if it wanted to. 
And that's why we are in practice constantly subjected to their traffic outside the recommended hours. Every weekday before eight, every Sunday before nine and after one, every Sunday. Imposing an hours of use condition that you know the applicant cannot and will not comply with would be absurd. It would be unenforceable and unreasonable. It would be contrary to the requirements of the national planning framework. Can this council properly do that? The answer must be no. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on, uh, perhaps uh, Andrew Aldridge could come up to the table. Would you like to go back on anything? No? Okay, you're going to do it at the end. Andrew Aldridge? Thank you. You have, you have two minutes, Mr Aldridge. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for hearing us. Um, the members must remember that this is a working farm. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of this, uh, of this application and the previous application together with the current appeal. And I'm not sure there's much to add uh, to those. The case officers once more have succinctly set out as to why this second application should be permitted. So again, I'll not dwell on this. And I quote, the proposal would result in social and economic benefits. It would support and contribute to the wider rural economy located in an established agricultural building suitable for conversion. It would sustain an agricultural countryside based enterprise. The service provided is an important part of the rural economy and an important service to the area. For these reasons, the proposed development is considered acceptable. These are words and phrases set out in the responses, both in the pre application, the first application, and this, the current second application. And as the members know, in each case has been recommended for approval. I'll not dwell on the comments made by the opponents of this application. These have been more than adequately dealt with in the case officer report, notwithstanding the conditions. We've not heard yet the result of the first appeal. However, should this application not succeed, there's no doubt in, in our minds that uh, an inspector would uphold an appeal on this application. Another refusal with the resultant appeal would involve yet more work, public money, time and effort, on an already stretched planning department. This is an unusual statement, but I'll leave the members to decide if this is good value for the public purse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin Heath, please. <coughs> you have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> the first point I would like to um relate to was at the last meeting a couple of people mentioned that the a24 is very busy and very dangerous and it's a 70 mile an hour limit well it's not a 70 mile an hour limit let's get it right it's a 60 and it's no more dangerous than any other main road because i've crossed it several times this season <clears throat> secondly i would like to highlight how important Chank chankton regain processing plant is for the local, sh local shooting community and economy. And I feel I just can't stress this enough. We, the shooting community, I'm a full-time gamekeeper, just so you know, and, and deer stalker. We are not seen as being very PC and we are often reluctant to put our heads above the parapet and voice our point. Well, I'm quite short, so it's not very often my head comes above the parapet, but I've hardly ever been public speaking before, and this is how important I think it is. Global warming is constantly in the news, and with it, the contribution to air and water pollution made by farm animals. Wild animals need their numbers to be managed, but also have a low carbon footprint, with very few miles from source to fork, and are clearly the way forward. But we need a processing plant, please. Thank you very much for your time in considering these points. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Peter Setterfield, please. You have two minutes. Uh, 
I'm an advisor to a game shoot um, that has dealt with Chankton Game for 19 years. In other work, I specialize in environmental stewardship. Chankton Game is a successful, well-established rural business, which adds considerable value to the area by providing a necessary service to the growing game market. There is an increasing demand for game as is an extremely healthy free range food. Several major supermarkets have pledged to stock UK game following the introduction of non-toxic ammunition. In addition, there is a steady demand from restaurants, butchers and farmers markets, both here and across the channel. The proposed location for the business is ideal as it, as it is situated in a region with many game shoots and the nearest alternative significant processors would be in Andover or Tunbridge Wells. We also have in the area an unsustainably large population of deer. The game shooting industry brings in over £2 billion per annum to the UK economy. It provides employment and brings much needed income to a variety of rural businesses. It is essential that the end product enters the food chain. The southeast has seen an explosion in deer population, which causes huge damage to agricultural crops, endangers woodland ecosystems, and in overgrazed areas reduces biodiversity. Deer are being culled, and it would be a travesty if the resulting meat did not enter the food chain. A local game processing unit will ensure that healthy and nutritious venison will not become a waste product, and instead will provide a traceable, natural food, which is low in food miles. In summary, it would be hard to think of a more appropriate business as an agricultural diversification in this farm setting. I understand that Chankton Game have satisfied all the material planning requirements, and I hope the committee will approve the application in the proposed location. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councillor Mary Leppard from Whiston. You have five minutes. Thank you. In case it is relevant, I live on North Lane, but I do not live near next to the farmyard where the accident site is based, nor do I live on the bridleway to and from the site. Now that we have seen how the applicant's business operates, we know it has three profound damaging effects. It harms the residential one, it harms the residential properties right next door to the site, and those who live on the public bridleway, that is the access to the site. Two, it harms the environment for so many people with their animals that walk down the public bridleway. Three, it puts safety massively at risk. The junction with the A24 is already dangerous. It is a fast moving 70 miles an hour dual carriageway. It has no speed camera close to the junction has no deceleration lane for traffic coming in from the north. It is an accident waiting to happen. The more traffic that uses this junction, especially in the dark and wet winter months when the applicant's business is at its busiest, the greater the risk. The applicant's traffic is made worse by the fact that it sells its meat direct from the farm. Drivers often stop the local residents or knock on their doors to ask where to find the farm shop or the venison shop. The applicant openly encourages its customers on Facebook to come to the farm to collect their purchases. This retail trade makes the impact of business even worse for the re local residents. Yet the parish council always understood that retail trade was never going to be allowed. 
the traffic concerns and highway safety concerns that caused this committee to refuse this application last January have not gone away. The frequency, size and timings of the traffic that we now know to be associated with the applicant's business in practice have in fact increased those concerns. Those problems will not be cured by conditions with which the applicant has expressly said it cannot comply. They will not be cured by conditions with which we now know the practice or the applicant does not comply. If, this, if the parish council has any cred credibility in planning issues, we urge this committee to maintain its previous refusal of this application on traffic and highway safety grounds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, do you want to come back? Okay. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so just coming to the, the points that were raised, uh, firstly, the um, the application was deferred uh, from the October committee on the basis of water neutrality and neighbour amenity impact, uh, with the intention that additional information be submitted in respect of those. Uh, so as outlined within uh, the presentation, the applicant has submitted a water neutrality statement and a noise assessment to address those concerns. Uh, in relation to the water neutrality statement uh, and the concerns raised by the speakers, uh, there is no evidence at this point that the, um, the operator intends to increase employee numbers at the site. Uh, so based, based upon on that, um, and the fact that the proposal is a sewer generous use specific to, to the, the, the use uh, outlined, uh, it is considered that the, the assessment undertaken in terms of the water strategy has been sufficiently precautionary. Uh, in terms of the noise assessment, again, that has uh, looked at vehicle movements and noise resulting from vehicle movements, where it has been recognised that the site uh, already experiences noise and is impacted by the A24, with the vehicle movements associated with the development specifically being no greater than that background noise in the daytime period. Uh, it is acknowledged that vehicle movements in the nighttime period would be uh, harmful to the neighbour neighbor, uh, green properties, and that's why conditions are recommended to address that, um, specifically conditions 12, which restricts restricts deliveries to only certain periods of time. Um, there are also conditions in terms of a delivery management plan to uh, address how deliveries will be undertaken uh, and operating hours for the site as well. Um, and then uh, again, the noise assessment has recognised that certain plant is, is causing an impact and conditions are uh, recommended to address that as well. So condition nine requires a sound attenuation strategy uh, to, to upgrade those enclosures. Um, also going back to um, the conditions, condition 10 does restrict the, the use of this premises for the processing, um, packaging and preparation of game meat. Now that would be the lawful use. Some retail sales could potentially be undertaken as ancillary to that use, but if it, but that is a matter of fact and degree. Uh, if there was a material intensification, then that would fall outside of that condition uh, where planning permission would be required. So um, just to be aware of that. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tamara. Okay, now we go to local members. Councillor Blackall. Thank you, Chairman. Um, listening to what has been said, uh, my view is not really ordered on this application in the fact that it's uh, the right business in the wrong place. And from what has been said even today is that going forward, it is recognised there's been quite a lot of publicity recently that the deer population in the whole of the country, uh, and this part will be part of it, is exploding. So that the 
need to cull deer on an increasing basis going forward is going to just grow and grow and grow. So that uh, the need for water and expansion of this business will, you know, will go on. And that uh, no doubt part of that business plan is that this is, this is what is going to be based on, that it's going to be a growing, ongoing business, a necessary business. Um, but uh, it is one whereby, you know, the other thing that annoys me about it, of course, is that the fact that we haven't granted permission, that this business has continued going without any permission on this. So they rather ignored and treated this committee with contempt by just going plowing ahead, almost in the belief that we're going to have to agree it anyhow. Um, and that I don't think going forwards um, that this is the right site for what is clearly a necessary business. And uh, you know, I would be certainly voting against this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Circuits. Um, I wonder whether I could start with a question um, related to the suggested conditions. Um, unless I haven't been paying attention over the years, which is possible, um, I don't think I can recall a situation where you had so many conditions, I think it's nine or 10 here, that one can only describe as a, an expression of hope. And given the evidence, given the evidence that um, we have from residents, um, we know that some of these have already been broken. Um, indeed, we've got a, I've got here a letter from, uh, an email from the agent saying uh, that we cannot comply with Paul Hobbs' time suggestions or requests. Um, we know, because I've got the figures here, that the number of vehicles is actually well, they were logged on the 23rd of December. There were 48 vehicle movements, not the 15 that are suggested by the report. So what I would ask the, the officers to address is this point that what I see here is a, a set of conditions that look like an expression of and given the experience of residents and the facts, some of which I have quoted, it I would call it the expression of hope over experience. And so why do the officers feel that they can persist uh, with pushing these proposed conditions in such a situation? Thank you. Long then I'll com come back if I may. Yeah. I'll come forward on. Thank you. Um, it's not unusual to have a number of regulatory conditions on a planning application. Happy to send you some examples, Councillor Circus. Um, but we, we do regularly have have development with with a with a number of conditions. Obviously, the larger the application, normally the, the larger the number of conditions. Um so I don't think it's unusual to, to see what you have before you hear. Um, obviously, officers have considered those conditions are necessary to make the development acceptable. And we also consider that those conditions are enforceable. We have to ensure conditions meet those tests before we recommend them, which we have done so. You can't refuse a development because you feel they may or may not comply with the conditions. If there is a condition that can be imposed, which is relevant and necessary and which is enforceable, which would alleviate any concerns, then you should impose it rather than refusing the application. Obviously, having these conditions puts us in a much, much stronger position because it's there in black and white. And if they're not adhered to, we can pursue them and, if necessary, take enforcement ag action against them. In terms of the... Um, hours of operation clearly we've got evidence 
that supports that condition. So I'm confident that we could enforce that. Now, if the applicants, excuse me, if the applicants consider that that, that they they consider that's unreasonable, then they can pursue an appeal against the condition if if they wish to. But again, I, I feel we have an evidence base that supports our position. So I'm I'm confident and satisfied that the conditions are relevant, are necessary, are enforceable. And my view is they make the development acceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think with, with respect, uh, I, I think uh, the head of development has slightly misunderstood what I was asking. Um, of course, I know that you can have a development with an enormous list of condi conditions. But what surprised me was the way in which on a whole raft of conditions, we're hoping that the applicant come, come forward with the evidence to justify that condition. Now, that's, that's the bit, Chairman, that I think is unusual. Um, I don't know whether... Can we just answer that? Yes. Thank you. Um, normally, you would have a number of those conditions, but they would generally be prior to commencement conditions or prior to occupation. So you would always have a trigger point by when that information is required to be submitted. Um, in this instance, obviously, the development is retrospective that they're already on the site. So you would need, therefore need to have a time scale by when, when that um, information is submitted. And obviously, that time scale needs to be as soon as possible, but also needs to recognise the fact that they might need specialist information and procure consultants to deliver that, which is hence the time scales on there. Thank you. Yes, I, I've, yes, I, I find... Uh, Given what uh, the requirements are for planning conditions, I find it slightly surprising um, uh, that we there's so much conditionality about these conditions that they must come back with evidence basically to justify uh, the condition, uh, which seems to me at odds with, with what planning conditions are all about. But if I can um, go on, there's a planning condition in paragraph 10 which has already been touched on. This is the retail sales that have been going on at this site. And it makes it quite clear, processing, preparation and packaging and for no other purpose. And yet we were told by the officer that a little bit of retail can be regarded as ancillary and therefore acceptable, uh, which seems to make a nonsense of having a condition that says, it will be for these purposes only and for no other purpose. Yeah, would you like to? I think my, what my colleague was referring to is if the odd person every now and then comes to get something, could we genuinely say there was a breach of that condition, you know, in terms of going to the heart of the condition? I think you, you have a use which is your primary use if you did something every now and then, very occasionally, you wouldn't fundamentally change the use of a building or what you're doing. But if, if that was on a regular basis, and that may or may not be the case, if that was on a regular basis and it formed form a, a reasonable portion of that business, then you effectively are changing the use of that building and you would therefore require a fresh planning permission you would be in breach so, so it was just to add caution in terms of you know we wouldn't be able to enforce something that happened not very regularly at all but if it became a, a fundamental part of the business then it would be something we can enforce we just wanted to be realistic about how planning actually worked in, in, in reality thank you well that's interesting i've learned something today that the council can make conditions which don't have to be complied with as long as you can regard the non-compliance as de minimis. I think we've all learned something today. Um, now, um, if I, I can move on to this subject of water neutrality, I don't think, if I may say so, that the suggestion about water neutrality, uh, what, what we were told is that as long as it appears water neutral now, that's all right. And, and that also deals with the point about perpetuity. I don't think it does. 
Um, I'm reading from a, uh, a Natural England document here. They say that while the measures set out in the proposal's water neutrality statement appear ecologically sound, they should be secured in perpetuity. There is clearly two aspects to this. Are we satisfied now? And have we secured these uh, limitations on water neutrality in perpetuity? And what I think the officers said is that because we're satisfied with the situation now, ergo it's, it's satisfied in perpetuity, uh, which um, I don't think is what okay. uh, naturally... Can we, can we stop that there yeah. and perhaps uh, then will I come back? Can I remind you too that I've given you six minutes, so you're really... Only it's a very important application no, I understand. For, for our residents. I understand. That. I think there's some confusion. I think um, what 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 we're seeking in perpetuity and what natural england said is the measures to be secured in perpetuity so the measures relate to the offsetting strategy on those five properties that will be secured in perpetuity via a section 106 legal agreement that's what the perpetuity element is my colleague is right in in the fact that we have to assess the business as it is now in terms of water neutrality and the measures as i said are being secured in perpetuity what is a consideration is the headroom. Um, now, officers acknowledge there is limited headroom here. Now, there is no specific guidance on how much headroom a development must have in water neutrality. Um, it's something you can consider, but bearing in mind there's no specific guidance on it. And on the basis of, of now, it, it is water neutral. I think it's, it's a difficult position to take, but that's something for members to be mindful of. But the perpetuity point is with regard to the um, offsetting on those properties, which would be secured by a legal agreement. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll try and... Can you be as brief as... I'll try and speed this up, thank Chairman, you. and I, thank you for your uh, indulgence. Um, I... Uh, Natural England re require us to, uh, to, to secure this in perpetuity. I don't personally believe it'll be secured by, even by the end of this year, because it's quite clear that this business is going to expand. Uh, we, all the indications are it will expand. And I su suggest that by the end of this year, let alone perpetuity, uh, that there will be an excess in terms of water neutrality. Um, I've already pointed out that the, a lot of the information in the report, I think is invalid. Uh, as I mentioned, on the 23rd of December, the residents did a very detailed survey and they found 48 movements related to the processing plant, not 15. Um, so um, my, uh, most of the, a lot of the, the comments have been made by the speakers and, and very well. But it seems to me, uh, Chairman, an appeal is already lodged. It would make sense for that appeal, for us to turn this application down today, for this appeal to go forward. Um, uh, you, you will know from Chairman, from the question I asked at the beginning of this afternoon's meeting, uh, we can consider it as fairly unlikely that there would be an award of costs for what I understand is going to be a documents only uh, appeal. So um, I would ask my colleagues um, to take the view that economic factors are all very well, but they, there is no principle in planning law that economic factors trump all other considerations. And if you look at the highway problems, if you look at the nuisance to neighbours, if you look at noise, if you look at water neutrality, these factors have not been satisfactorily settled right. by what's in front of us today. Okay. Thank, you, Thank you very much, because we need to give uh, any, somebody else a chance. So sorry, I'm afraid with commitments, I've got to go. Oh, OK. I do apologise, Mr Chairman. All right. Councillor Clark. Oh, sorry, I can't imagine. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chairman. I'm just a um, simple chat, and um, I am somewhat confused as to what officers have said now. 
for me, water neutrality was all about you can't take any more water from Hardham than what you're already taking from Hardham. So if you want to do anything, you've got to make sure you're not taking any more water from Hardham in simplistic terms. But what I've just heard, or what I think I've heard is this planning application is okay because we've calculated the volume now, the volume now is okay because of the physical measures that are being put in place because these five houses also belong to the landowner or whatever, so they don't have to get a, approval from the people who live there. But then, then did I hear correctly that it's not an issue about limiting the volume in the future, which then flies to the heart of the principle of water neutrality, which you're not going to take any more water from Hardham, what, whatever happens. And I am somewhat confused as to what the officers are saying now. Because I thought it was fairly fairly clear, but I'm not so clear anymore. Maybe can they elaborate or correct or whatever? I will try and Laura come in if you need to. Um, we we can only control what's reasonable through planning to control, and we can only assess an application on the facts before us today. So we have to assess it now on, for instance, how many employees are at the property. We cannot in any shape or form control how many employees a business has. We can't control that. Um, and we have to assess it on what we have before us now. Clearly there are other, other controls within planning though, which we must bear in mind. Any new um, buildings, et cetera, on the site, which may be required to facilitate an expansion of the business would require planning permission. And they would all have to demonstrate water neutrality if water neutrality was in, 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 in um, still around then. Um, if the the business changed and was a different use, again, it would need a fresh planning application and they would have to demonstrate water neutrality. So there are matters which we can control the future intensity of operations on the site, but clearly that's only where planning permission is required. Um, we, we can't control the number of employees. And this is where I was discussing headroom. Um, where you may have heard some of my colleagues for planning applications quoting different headroom that there is for schemes. I think officers acknowledge this scheme has limited headroom um, and, and, that, and that's something members may wish to consider. But on the basis of what we have before us today and on the basis of how many employees there are, it is water neutral. Thank you, Chairman. I am afraid I am still confused on the wiser because, as I said, if I'm looking at the volume of water consumed today, fine, I get it, but I'm not convinced about the volume down the highway because that's not being controlled, I think is what Emma said. Well, no, as I understand, that's not, not what you're saying. What you're saying, what I, as I understand it is that we are we are deciding on an application today. So what evidence we have today is what we are debating and what we're going to decide on, not what could happen in the future. Something else could happen down the line where the staff reduce rather than go up. We simply don't know. But that so, doesn't that expose us to legal 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 doesn't that expose us to legal challenge true. down the road because we have to be water neutral in perpetuity. Do you, do you see the point I'm trying to make? Yeah, I, I can we, see the point. We, we, we're we not, we're, there's nothing to say, we're, it's not water ne neutral in perpetuity in, in the sense, clearly that's what we, we envisage to happen, but all we can do through the planning system is consider the measures that mitigate the impact in perpetuity. And, and that's clearly what we are controlling through the the application and the legal agreement, you know, that as I said, there are elements outside of the control of the planning system that we could not reasonable have any control over. So I cannot see how there could be a challenge over matters that we just simply could not control through the planning system. You would have that in you you have that where you have we have an average occupancy for for houses, don't we? You know, what if they had 10 people in that house? You know, we, we can only control what's, what we have a reasonable evidence base for and make a reasonable decision, which is what I think you have before you. Thank you. Are you happy with that? I'm not happy, but at least. Council Wright. Thank you, Chair. Um, it feels very much like we're trying to move the bar on this application. Uh, I'll stand further away from the mark. Mike. I mean, this has come to committee several times uh, and has been 
debated and turned over for all sorts of reasons that have ranged from traffic to um, you know impact on the local community to noise and smell and it really feels like there is any excuse not to grant permission for what is an incredibly valued part of the rural community. Only three percent of our population is employed in agriculture or food processing. It is a very small part of the economy but so important. Without uh, businesses like Chanctonbury Game, you would not be able to enjoy the food that you eat. Although some some of us would, some of us are vegans. But um, you know, if uh, this is such an important part of the rural fabric, and that is why we have an application which has so many positive comments from across the uh, county and local community. The South Downs National Park has said that this should be granted permission. How often do they say that an application should, should go forward? I really do think this is the first in my career as a councillor where I've seen the South Downs National Park wanting them. And just to remind you, this is or an active farmyard. There is uh, noise and smell associated with it. It feels very much like uh, those who are against this application are against it because it involves shooting, because it involves elements of the rural community. You know that this is uh, this is not really about matters of course because we've addressed those. We've talked about the road safety elements. We've talked about the noise. In fact, that was one of the reasons why the application was deferred at last time was to allow a noise survey to be undertaken. And the applicant has come back and put in mitigation that's now part of the uh, recommendations. Sorry, one of the conditions as part of the recommendation. And at every turn, they have jumped through our hoops. And every meeting that this comes around, we find a new reason to defer it or refuse it. There is absolutely no doubt that this business is vital to the rural community. That vitality means that it overrides uh, the concerns of local residents because of its wider community impact. And I implore you all to put this to bed, to uh, vote for it, and make sure this vital rural business has the future that it needs. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Any other council want to come in? No? Alan? Yes. Oh, sorry, Councillor Crocus. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it brief. It doesn't involve water. You'd be pleased to know. Um, but it does involve noise. And I, I was just curious why the noise report didn't use the metric L10. That's the noise level extended 10% of the time. And instead use SEL, uh, which is a kind of equivalent energy level. Um, L10 is widely used for traffic noise. Um, and the other point I'd make is the um, most affected dwellings are something like three metres from the access road and something like 60 odd metres from the A24. So there's clearly a, uh, a much stronger influence on their local transient noise um, from vehicles using that track than from the A24. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we haven't got that technical information before us, Councillor Croker, and I would encourage members, if you have technical questions, please do ask officers before the committee, and then we can ensure we can have the discussions with relevant specialists. Unfortunately, we don't, we're not technical experts in noise assessments ourselves, and we will rely on the expertise of our environmental health officers. They have, they reviewed it, and obviously they consider the methodology acceptable and have, have supported it with subject to the conditions. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to come in? No? Okay. In that case, uh, the recommendation is to approve full planning permission subject to appropriate conditions and the completion of a Section 106 legal agreement. In the event that the legal agreement is not completed within three months of the decision of this committee, the director of place be authorised to refuse permission on the grounds of failure to secure the obligations necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms. So can I have a show of hands for all those in favour of the recommendation, please? Okay. All those against? Okay. All right, Liz. And all those abstaining? So we had seven, four, three against, and five abstentions. Thank you. So in that case, the uh, planning permission has been has been granted. Thank you very much. Um, item eight. There's no urgent business, I don't think. 
Um, so I'll close the meeting at um, five past five. Thank you all for your time. Long and messy. Don't like messy. Yes. They get entrenched.